Hi, and welcome back to SDI Coffee Break. And again, we're with Sam Gross from Choiceworks. Hi, Sam. Hello, David. How are you? Good, good. It's nice to have you with us again. Good. Really great session, the last one, and I'm hoping we'll be able to elaborate some of that now as we go through this uh, session as well. Uh, some very interesting stuff, some really good topics, uh, topic uh, content as well. So let's, let's, let's maybe look at uh, where we are right now in the industry. If you look at, you know, years, you mentioned Eichel in the last one, uh, you know, 15, 20 years, 30 years of building this very comprehensive system of, of, of managing and delivering IT services. Where do you think we are currently? So if we look at the industry, if you look at the, the still the predominance of, of voice over anything, you know, the move away from email and on organizations still grappling and grasping on to what email is as a channel and probably not the best channel in the world, if I was being very honest. What, what do you think about that shift from being reactive, a reactive service to proactive? And how do you think organizations, what, how they should be thinking? What do they need to do to try and look at that as a serious thing and, and sort of work towards making that shift? Yeah, so that's such a great question. If, uh, let's kind of try to frame that conversation off in terms of the kind of current discourse in the industry. So the current discourse in the industry is all about digital transformation. Business at the speed of digital. And so, um, I would argue that this is not the first time in our industry's history that we face this dilemma, but in fact, we're attempting to kind of change the paradigm from, oh, client server and web apps to some type of highly intelligent digital channels that are delivering business and delivering value to end users. Now, while we're doing that at the application layer, what we're doing at all of the support layers, which means really short of the software components and the middlewares and the application development techniques that we're using, nothing's changing. The industry as a whole, and I, I really, have to admit, I scratch my head, the industry as a whole is attempting to deliver digital speed on top of an infrastructure and a support infrastructure that operates at human speed. The impedance mismatch between our desires and our capability to me is mind boggling. And, you know, I could probably uh, pull out half a dozen examples, but I'll start with a really little one. So organizations are rolling out robotics process automation as a form of intelligent automation as perhaps, if not the answer to all, let's simply agree that it is at least a gateway automation technique, right? It's kind of first base. And as we roll that out, we're rolling that out across the industry. And the technologies to actually manage RPA as a new application layer, there's no technology in the industry to manage it. Mm. We're back to using native consoles a UI path orchestrator or an automation anywhere control room. By the way, that reminds me in our industry of when we first rolled out our first storage area networks, networking uh, gear from EMC, and we rolled out our first routing infrastructure from Cisco, and we rolled out our first distributed data center technologies running on NT in a data center. Well, we had one console in the data center with a guy watching the storage devices. We had another guy staring at, uh, at Cisco Works. And we had another guy, guy of course being a gender neutral term, uh, that's important here in the US, watching some systems management console to see if the servers were operating or choking. Well, there was 
no concept of manager of manager. There was no concept of uh, end-to-end application monitoring. A lot of these things we have today, we take them for granted. And by the way, we wouldn't imagine. We wouldn't even think for a minute that we could launch new technologies, new applications, new services, new digital transformation without any of that. We wouldn't even think about it yet. We're actually doing it. See, that's the beauty of this industry. The beauty of this industry is that history repeats itself, and we seem to be students of history. And we do the same thing again and again. We rolled out client-server technology. We had no technology to manage it. It took years until we had Unicenter, and we had Tivoli, and we had other technologies uh, that became sufficiently ubiquitous that we actually knew what was going on. So... So if you really look at where we are as an industry, uh, we're kind of recycling the next era. And we don't have the tools. We haven't thought about the need of the tools. Well, I don't want to say that as a whole because we've done that here at ChoiceWorks. Uh, I think that uh, having seen... uh, the, the new introduction of new technologies into the IT industry multiple times in my career. Uh, first was client server, second were web technologies and the internet and networking, and now finally automation. It's kind of like round three, same problem. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that part of why this happens in our industry is we we become very married to, we fall in love with paradigms. We fall in love with our frameworks. We fall in love with how we do work. And so uh, what that actually does is that actually creates a certain drag, resistance to moving forward quickly. And it's it's a critical problem for our industry. We give it lots of names. We say the not invented here. We say mm, we don't want to introduce any new risk and any new paradigms. But what we're really doing is we're tree hugging. I refer to it as tree hugging. We don't want to change the organization. We don't want to change uh, the way that we do things. And we don't want to change the technologies that we're doing. I don't believe that there's another uh, major sector in business where if the data changes, we do not revisit the decisions we made in the past, mm. except for IT. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, actually. And, and, and sort of uh, the use of, of, of that in context to one delivering, but moving forward. I think there is a safety, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, there is some, some safety in the vanilla aspect of if it says we should follow it, I'm safe. I'm not risking, I'm not risking my reputation, my job, my livelihood. You know, I think there's some of that in there as well. And I think what will be interesting when we go maybe through the next video is to talk about what that means from a technology point and how that fits into all that. How 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 technology like you know ChoiceWorks, Optinium, how it fits into that. How it maybe tries to revolutionise the way that people think about that service as well. You mentioned intelligent automation. How does that differ from from regular automation? What's the difference between the two? There's, we hear a lot about you know hyper automation about and, and a, there's a lot of buzzwords out there when we when we talk about stuff like this. What is intelligent automation and how how does that dis, dif, differ to just task automation to make things easier? What's the difference now? Yeah, well, uh, so task automation, desktop. Uh, uh, process automation, robotics process automation, intelligent automation, hyper automation. Oh my God. <laughs> so we're not short. We're not short of labels in this industry, right? So we're really good at that. I think we all learned how to do that first from IBM. I think they taught us lessons, right? Lessons that stayed with us for our entire careers. So I think that it's worthwhile to actually think about what are we trying to accomplish with automation. Mm. Uh, I would argue that what we're attempting to accomplish is extracting the need for humans to produce an outcome. 
And so if you adopt that principle in what you're trying to do, um, it might lead you to ask the question, why are humans necessary in the production of some digital outcome? Mm. Simple question. Not which technique of automation is better, but can you complete and achieve an outcome without human intervention someplace, human in the loop, before that is all done? And I think that that answer is actually no. Now, why is that a shocking answer? Because even in the design of the automation, there's a requirement for the human in order to help the machine understand what mm -hmm. is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, whether we're doing process discovery with keystroke logging and machine learning to do noise eradication, signal to noise ratio, and try to identify the true happy path. I mean, there's so many technologies out there, whether they're data or data mining technologies that have become very popular. At one point in the process, there is a human. But what is it that the human adds? The human adds the simple ingredient, however, the important ingredient of human cognition. Human cognition. And so what does human cognition deliver? Human cognition delivers decision-making. That's how we operate. We, we make decisions by aggregating memories, good memories, bad memories, and then associating those memories with actions that we take that really define behaviors. It's, it, it sounds a little bit abstract, but... I argue that the technologies that we're delivering today are not that abstract. I think that if we think in very fundamental ways around how we do work, I think we can understand it. And so as you begin to use all of those words, task automation, robotics process automation, uh, those are, if you will, clones of actions that humans take that defines an endpoint to that cognitive process. Mm. This is what I do. I did this because I've done the job for five years and I find this to be the most efficient way. It was a lot of decision making that went into that. Uh, now we move up to things like um, intelligent automation and hyper automation. So both actually denote the aggregation of different automation techniques and capabilities in order to accomplish an outcome. Mm -hmm. Still, I argue that neither of those can operate without the benefit of the human cognition that defines the what and the why. More importantly, the context, mm -hmm. which a lot of these wonderful process discovery tools don't really understand. And so that's a big deal. The human understands the context. So when in uh, about 2012, when it really came to me that everything that I had done in my career since 1998, 1995 was about to become obsolete, mm -hmm. I began to take a very deep look at how do I identify and replace the core piece that has not been replaced in automation to date. And that was the ability to replace the element of human cognition that's associated with the actions that we take. Mm -hmm. And so uh, starting in 2012, what my research began to uh, surface was that uh, I may have been overstating the importance of human cognition in the automation process. I may have been giving it too much importance. And what began to make me believe that? As I studied, and I argue our metrics across our industry will illustrate, a very large percentage of everything we do in IT is highly repetitive. Mm -hmm. It's represented in a knowledge article. It's represented in a script. It's 
represented in a manual. It's represented in a process framework. It's actually highly repetitive. And so, so the replication of that uh, is kind of like layer one of what we should be doing. The problem with all of that repetitive stuff is the exception. So the second truism in IT is that, you know, we've spent a lifetime talking about asset management, change management, configuration management, configuration drift, standard operating environment, common operating environment. Oh my God. It is the one thing that we haven't accomplished. And so I asked myself the question and we did the research and we asked ourselves, will the diversity in IT increase or decrease over the next five years? And the answer was, it will increase. When we talk about the ease in which IT can now be delivered and we use our smartphone as an example and our ability to tap an icon and download a piece of software, actually more importantly, choose a piece of software, register and then use it. And then by the way, the rich ecosystem of connectors and interconnectors, whether it's a Microsoft Flow or a Zapier or other forms and types of connectors which are all over the SaaS industry, the reality is, is that the way the diversity and of, of technologies that we use and the way that we use them will only continue to increase and increase at a faster pace. And so then and therefore, what became clear is that not only was there a highly repetitive component of what we do in IT, but we must address the ability to replace human cognition at some percentage of the support or the technology process. And so we put ourselves to work to actually figure out how can we uh, replicate the mechanisms by which IT professionals, not a research scientist, not a forensic investigator, but how does an IT professional in a narrow domain um, collect memories and use those memories to make decisions and drive behaviors. And so we built an engine that allowed us to do that. And with that, uh, we have been able to actually break the mold. And uh, let me describe that mold. Um, that mold is something which is imperative in style, which means uh, declarative structures, whether it's if then else is case structures or any other type of uh, static type uh, of um, instruction set that we use in order to uh, automate IT. Um, the second piece that we were able to kind of break the paradigm around was a requirement or expectation of uh, some set of standards. And the way that we did that was by saying, if we're able to eliminate you, human labor, then the labor that we're expending in doing things one at a time instead of batch was in fact digital labor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, almost had a negligible of in, in, or, or, or in fact, no cost at all. Mm -hmm. And so that was the second very important piece. And then the third uh, the third piece that we really embraced was a reality that not many of us are really in touch with. So we did a lot of research around something that we refer to as fault surface. So some of us are familiar with the concept of an attack surface in the security paradigm, but very few of us really think about a fault surface. So not only, not only do we have to address uh, some percentage of highly repeatable and uh, uh, um, I would call it um, well-known um, actions for automation, but we need the ability to actually make decisions around that. Uh, not only do we need to deal with diversity in configuration and maybe change the paradigm of working in batch, but more importantly, we have to understand that the problems and faults that we encounter in the month of January are not going to be the problems and the faults that we encounter in the month of June. Why? Mm -hmm. Because faults occur 
because of change. Change occurs whether it's at the operating system level coming from Microsoft or, uh, or Mac OS X and whether those changes are coming from your ERP vendor or coming from another piece of software that we're using, whether it's SaaS and operating within your browser or whether it's client software that's operating on a, a smartphone or another device, but change occurs. Change occurs in a highly uncoordinated way um, and then and therefore faults, bugs, and conflicts exist. However, they have a limited life. Mm -hmm. So we see a particular problem that exists. We send some people off and they write a bunch of scripts to solve that problem. Uh, so after some period of time, let's say problem exists for two weeks, becomes a top call generator, goes to an automation group, they build some scripts, they test some script, maybe a month later those things are deployed. Mm. Well, by that time they've been reported to Intel and Microsoft and all the other vendors, and slowly but surely they begin to build hot fixes, changes to drivers, and mm. then over some period of time those get deployed. And I would argue that certainly within 120 to 180 days, all the problems that you build scripts for, well, they're not a problem anymore. Mm. Ah, but there's a whole new set of problems. Mm. And so the fault surface is, consist is continuously changing. And so we had to really think about that. And we had to ask ourselves, how do we use technology that can prune out the things that we're doing, which the OEMs and the ISVs have already addressed, so that we're still efficient and well-focused? And then how do we incrementally use the learnings that we have, the uh, memories that we have stored in our, in our um, databases, if you will, and the behaviors, which are the sequences that we've learned to follow? And then how can we use those as the base to incrementally add just a small piece of something new create? So how do we get around zero day fault remediation uh, how do we prune out uh, uh, the things that we're still doing that are unnecessary? And when you take those three things that I just mentioned and you put them together today, in fact, and in fact, for the last many, many years, there are a set of well-known, um, well-developed AI techniques that can be addressed to this. And so when I, when, when, when I completed my research, I came to the conclusion that by applying AI to something which was a very traditional industry that I worked in for 20 years, that that industry was about to be disrupted. It was about mm -hmm. to be disrupted with um, some uh, powerful uh, and capable technologies. And if we really look at the foundations of what we do and why we do it, if we look at the foundations of the challenges that we've had that have, have, have kind of precluded us from achieving our, 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 um, our dream, right, the holy grail, um, we're actually a lot closer to it. And uh, we think that we've cracked some, if not all, of the challenges in working in a very narrowly defined domain of end user support and device management. And we believe that we've delivered a multi-vector solution uh, that allows us to uh, address these problems, not only proactively, not only autonomously and instantaneously, uh, but also conversationally in concert with end users. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, that's a, that's a, a you know, com a complex answer. And I think certainly digging through some of that to, as you mentioned, contextualize, you mentioned the, 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 the digital speed and the human speed thing. It's really interesting, right? So I think we'll, we'll, we'll finish this one here. Um, what we'll probably look at in the next one, I think, is, 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 a, is a, so, you know, the next level of, of, of that conversation, evolving that conversation to talk about what you've developed at Transworks. What does fill that sort of gap? How does all that, you know, quite complicated, theoretical in, in, in some cases, stuff. How does that turn into a service, yeah? So maybe we'll talk about that in the next one. And maybe we'll, we'll talk about what that means. You mentioned sort of the cost, um, uh, the cost in relation to the technology, so digital labor and the cost efficiencies. Maybe we'll touch on the relationship there and labor arbitrage as well. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that, Sam. It's a, a very interesting, uh, 
answer, a complicated answer, but really interesting stuff, actually, when you try and, you know, work your way around that uh, in relation to what it means from a service perspective. Thank you for that. Thank you for our listeners, uh, for listening, and we'll catch you in the next session.